Welcome to episode seven of Unlayered. Today, the topic is centered on privacy, and our interview will be with Swen from Light Protocol. But on that topic, Dave, what are your thoughts on privacy in crypto generally? It still doesn't feel that the market is very advanced on. Vitalik, he just did a blog post, I don't know if you saw it, yeah. where he's talking about the Ethereum ecosystem, and he says that the three things they need are L2 scaling, uh, smart contract wallets, and privacy. And I was thinking myself personally, I've never even used a privacy tool in crypto before. I think for a number of reasons, some of them are on their own chains, uh, Monero and things like that, or they're just expensive. You know, I never used Tornado Cash because it was expensive. And then maybe you're worried about if that is a black mark against uh, against the ETH that you get out. So yeah, what, what are your thoughts out? Have you had any interactions and what are your views on, on the market? Yeah, I think uh, I have a lot of views. So my first altcoin I ever bought was Monero back in 2016. And incidentally, when I was working at Shapeshift, we had one of the co-creators of Monero come to the office and give a speech basically on privacy and his thoughts on it and the future of crypto. And what was astonishing from that conversation was how bearish he was privacy. It almost sounded like he was defeated and he almost gave up. He was just like, yeah, no one cares. Uh, and certainly Monero never really set the world on fire the, the way they probably thought it would. And so it's this weird dynamic where, yes, like crypto, specifically chains like Ethereum, Solana, basically any of these base layer L1s that have account states, they are a privacy nightmare. And it's super easy to you know, dox people and find out all the contracts and addresses they're interacting with because blockchains are public. So I think people recognize once they understand what's happening here that that's not a good thing. But the issue is, the user experience of privacy solutions for a number of reasons, whether it's just lack of an ecosystem or liquidity or just literally the the execution takes forever. Uh, it's not good on privacy chains and, and users tend to just always favor the easiest thing to use. And so now we're in a state where basically everything is super public and no one's using privacy solutions yet. We, it's clear that for crypto to become mainstream, these privacy solutions need to be kind of embedded into the fabric of, of future crypto products. Yeah, because if you think about the massive whales in TradFi, they don't want you knowing you know, what they're trading in and out of um, at any one time. So just that alone, yeah. I feel like yeah. trading at some level has to be private. And another element of that is, I think the direction of MEV in general is that it's all going to need to to sort of be partly hidden, basically, the transactions. Because if you can partly hide the transactions, there's still enough for, um, for the validators to, um, to organize them in a, in a sensible order, but you're not giving away all the information to, to sandwich bots and things like that. So I just think it has to move in this direction. And perhaps the reason we haven't seen it so much to date is the ETH dominance of the industry, really, and just how high the transactions were. So Tornado Cash, it hit some level of product market fit, but I believe it was very expensive to use. Um, and I think that's why Light Protocol, which we're talking about today, is, is so interesting because it's built on Solana. It leverages all of those uh, unique characteristics of just being super cheap and very fast uh, block times. Uh, and so maybe that's, that's what was needed to, to start bringing privacy more mainstream. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned Tornado Cash because the OFAC stuff really kind of turned it into almost a political issue where a lot of potential nefarious actors overseas were were using it to effectively launder money. And then you had on the ETH side, uh, like OFAC compliant block building where you know, flashbots basically only allowed for uh, OFAC compliant protocols interacting with Ethereum to be processed by them. And so effectively, if you're using Tornado Cash, you were waiting much longer for your block to get included. It'll be interesting to watch because I think the governments and kind of legacy uh, institutions might not like this idea of privacy native at the transaction level because it would basically be like Tornado Cash all the time where you could always just effectively have privacy and anonymity when you're transacting on crypto rails. So that, that'll that be a trend to watch. I think in the past, there's been kind of wars against cryptography broadly, and, and that battle might play out again as as these privacy protocols like Load Protocol and all the various other ones we see on the Ethereum side start to gain traction. 
So with that, we will move into our interview with Swen, co-founder of Light Protocol, and you can find him at at Swen underscore SJN on Twitter. What's exciting about this interview is Light Protocol is leading the charge of building ZK solutions on Solana. I think a lot of the conversation and focus on ZK tech and privacy has been pretty much exclusive to Ethereum as far as I could tell, Uh, but Light Protocol is going to allow that design space to expand over to what's possible on Solana. And a quick refresher, lightprotocol.com is the website. Uh, It is an open source ZK layer enabling private program execution uh, purpose built for Solana. And super insightful interview about, again, this this design space of what's possible with privacy, uh, specifically on the Solana side. Swen, thanks for joining us today. How's it going? Yeah, thanks for having me on. Uh, going well. How about you? Going well, going well. It's funny, actually, uh, here in the city, we just had the ZK Summit, I believe is what it's called, a conference. I didn't actually go, but know a lot of friends who went there. And I think ZK is one of those terms in crypto. You know, we hear all the time where, oh, yeah, you know, we're this startup building on ZK. Everybody's Everything's going to happen on ZK. That's where all the investors seem to be coalescing around. But... Let's start with this. What does ZK mean to you? Like, how would you define it for the layman? Because I, because I think it touches a lot of things, even outside of cryptocurrencies. Yeah, like magic, I think it hits it quite well. <laughs> That's how I define it to the layman. I mean, in essence, I think it's computation where the verifier doesn't need to know what's going on. It's the basis of like, even with crypto, right? Like if you have a wallet, most simple example of, uh, of ZK is when you sign a transaction, right? So basically what you do with your wallet is you prove to the blockchain in that case that you own these funds. You're the owner of a specific public key and no one needs to know your private key. Just you you know that private key. So, uh, you know, I think that's the most simple examples. They're like, it's super powerful technology. You know, the the way that I got started, I didn't do maths in, in college. I just slipped into it. I think like like a lot of people feel uh, right now about ZK. That's how I felt about it in you know a year ago, one and a half years ago, when my co-founder now, um, so he's a good friend from childhood. His name is Joe, and he introduced me to this whole thing. He was you know working on this as part of his master thesis in university, and he was like, "Oh, let's try to build something that introduces privacy." Yeah. In the blockchain space, so that was that was in summer 2021, ah, uh-huh. which is a while back. And, you know, the peak of the latest bull run. And he, we met up, you know, in Berlin. That's where we both both were based at during that time. And and he was like, "Yo, I'm building this thing. Just got a grant from these, you know, American investors. And it's basically something like, do you guys know Zcash? Yes, perfect. So it's basically, <laughs> you know, the idea of Zcash where you could have private token transactions and putting these on Solana. The idea was that, you know, on Ethereum, it just was way too expensive to do cool stuff with this CK, with with private state transitions. And then, you know, Solana back in summer before it sort of really started pumping was like this unproven but very interesting tech. And the idea really was to try build it on Solana, like try to verify a ZK proof on the Solana runtime, which, you know, the runtime is very constrained in, in sort of the transaction sizes that you can send and the compute units that you can have to compute your stuff uh, on chain. And that was the whole experiment. And I was like, sure, I didn't know anything about ZK. I didn't even know Rust. So it was like literally, <laughs> he was like, Hel- help me build this thing. I, you know, my background was just software engineering, mm-hmm. trying to build projects, build startups in, in college. Yeah. And and I was like, this is an interesting project. And I'm working with, you know, my friend whom I know for a long time. This is super cool. Let's just do it. Let's roll with it. And, you know, it's just sort of went from there. Awesome. That, that's an awesome story. I mean, kind of digging into it a bit. So so ZK is magic. And, and I've used examples of ZK on the Ethereum side. I think I, I played around with like ZK.money last year. And I think it's it's been deprecated since then. 
But I think one of the things that hit me was this is really cool, but it also took me like seven minutes to shield five dollars worth of you know Ethereum. So it's not very usable. What is I guess the key difference, if there is any, between your experiences and like let's call it the, the EVM side of zk versus doing things on Solana? Are there any new things that are enabled by building on the Solana side? Yeah. So well, first of all, the people building with zk on Ethereum, like those are sort of the OG. You know, a lot of the tech that we use, we mm-hmm. we owe to these people. Yeah. So like super smart folks building super cool technology with Ethereum. ZK is also used for scaling. Yeah. And that's, I think, where most of the hype has been coming from in the last couple of months. ZK VMs, I think there's three or four different players um, who, you know, a couple of months ago announced their respective ZK VMs. Mm-hmm. Because essentially what you can do with ZK is you can compute stuff off chain. And yeah. then on chain, you just prove that the computation was all right. So you can do that to get privacy, but you can also do that to, you know, scale because you can process many more transactions off chain than just proof that the whole computation was okay uh, on chain. Am I right that you're not inheriting the privacy elements on a lot of those scaling solutions on Ethereum? Oh yeah, that's actually a good question. That's an interesting one. In essence, it should be quite easy to enable privacy for for most of these zk VMs, right? So most VMs focus on scalability first because that's you know a very obvious thing that you know it's very problematic about Ethereum layer one right now uh, and has been for a couple of years. In essence, it's definitely doable to turn on privacy. I know that a couple of them are are sort of keeping it in the back of their head, and then there's some like uh, I don't know if you guys know um, Aztec Network. Right, they just recently raised enormous sums of money to um, launch their own so to speak zkvm is not really zkvm they call it something else mm. <laughs> um so hard to keep track yeah but they have built in privacy from the from the get-go you know zk money was sort of like one of the first iterations of that so actually ethereum has some really interesting uses for zk that solana doesn't really have and that's also why ultimately we we are on solana and why we love it is like solana has this built-in scalability right like solana is you know technically solves this whole dilemma that uh, people have on in ethereum where you know you have scalability security decentralization solana is really good at solving these things and the way it's looking um you know i'm very confident that it's just continuing to be better so we we sort of inherit the scalability from solana which is just amazing for us because now we have super fast verification times and we have super cheap transactions. So now we can just take the private computation part and do amazing things with it. Like it's not about the moving tokens around anymore. It's about actual like arbitrary state transitions. So like if you're building on-chain games before on public layer ones, you can't really have private state in multiplayer games, for instance. You can't have fog of war. So like there's just this limitation of use cases you know, that's what I'm super excited about with, with Light V3 is that we sort of enable that. Maybe it would be helpful to kind of lay out a framework for how this all works. So obviously you have Solana base layer, but what are the other pieces or stakeholders that enable this private execution? Well, first of all, why does Solana not have built-in privacy? There's basically two points to this. One is that the way that Solana has consensus is it's based on transparency. So like every validator can see in clear text what's happening. When I send you uh, USDC on chain, you know, everybody can verify that, you know, that's that's actually legit, that transaction. One of the major inventions of Bitcoin, right? Like core to blockchain in essence. So like state needs to be transparent, needs to be out there. The second thing is that Solana uses an account model for its state, right? So like everything is an account. Similar to how ETH works as well, just state is also like stored in accounts. When Solana processes a transaction, you have these slots of data, you know, as accounts that, you know, can be updated and and read from in parallel. The problem is that, you know, that leaks data because now you have these like specific slots that get updated with state. So for instance, if you and I both have USDC, right, we both have token accounts. And when I send you USDC, what happens is that the runtime just changes my account balance and yours in public 
So our new balances are reflected in just a you know variable change in uh, in state in that account, um, which obviously leaks a lot of lot of data. So you know the the question for how light works is really like how do we solve these two things? And it's quite complex, but in essence, what we do is that light protocol takes the computation step off chain. What I said in the beginning with we do a computation in the client, you know, this client could be a browser, could be a wallet on, on a mobile phone. We take that computation and we just generate a ZK proof, zero knowledge proof. And on chain, the Solana program just verifies that the computation was okay, right? So we don't do, we don't batch transactions, but we just like in real time, we just create these proofs for computed transaction and on chain, it's just verified that this transaction is okay. That's the first element is like we take this computation off chain. You know, it's sort of hard to grasp when there's when there's like no example. So taking you through sort of the the life cycle of this transaction, step zero is the user escrows his funds into light protocol or her funds, right? So like I'll, I'll just start with the example of just like tokens, just soul, because that's e- the easiest uh, to understand. In exchange for escrowing her funds, she gets an ownership node representing her funds, right? So that ownership node, you know, we call it UTXO. It's it's based on how blockchains like Bitcoin work, where unspent transaction outputs. It's just a you know a chunk of data, chunk of bytes. An IOU to say that you've deposited your soul into the Light Protocol. Is that fair? You know, the way that it's represented on chain is that each of these ownership nodes has you know so-called commitment like you cannot see from the utxo itself that this commitment belongs to utxo so this commitment is just stored as a leaf in a merkle tree on chain basically you know as soon as that leaf is part of the merkle tree we can now prove that we have ownership over whatever the utxo says because it's part of the merkle tree and we being light protocol in this example yeah, that's just a client, right? So, so, so it's all about uh, the client owns these UTXOs. There, there's a second part to it, and I'll get into that later with, with nullifying, like how do we actually you know, compute transactions? But basically what we have now is in the client, we have these ownership nodes, and now we can just compute the ZK proof over whatever we want to do with those nodes, right? So like, let's say I escrow five soul, and now I want to send two soul of that on chain privately, to another person, maybe to to you, Dave, in private, in this realm of the light protocol ZK layer. So off chain, we we com- I compute a proof, and on chain it just verifies. Like there's a program that just verifies that proof. And the cool thing is that the program doesn't know what happens. All it knows is that the computation that I did off chain, where I say I start with five soul, I get three soul, you get two soul, uh, and I encrypt it to your um, your key, right? Basically, the program just knows that it, this computation was all right. It doesn't actually know what's going on. Uh, just I know that. And then obviously, when you receive your funds, you know that that someone sent you tokens. You don't even necessarily know that I sent you tokens. Just so I'm clear, so if you're using this, you would need to send the five soul into the Light Protocol client. All of this magic wizardry happens in the background. That five soul could then be split up three and two soul between two other people. The proofs that these have happened will be confirmed on chain, but the details of what's happened to that five soul won't happen on chain. So I'm just trying to understand because surely the chain will know that five soul has gone somewhere and then it will presumably record that two and three soul have gone somewhere. Is it not clear that that had anything to do with Light Protocol? You see on chain that initially I moved five soul into the light protocol program escrow. You know, that's an actual transfer that's happening on chain. At that point, everything that happens inside the sort of shielded pool uh, that is light protocol, all of these state transitions, nothing actually moves, right? So the program just verifies proofs uh, and all that changes is uh, the the ownership of, of the funds that are escrowed in the pool. It happens in a way where it cannot be linked to like single entities. When someone eventually leaves the light protocol pool, then as well, you know that someone, you don't know who, but someone sent X amount of soul or whatever it is, could be an NFT, to a normal Solana address. And then obviously you have that receiving ant be in public as well. So say, for instance, I want to send Dave 
$100 and I don't want this to be traceable on chain, it seems to me like, you know, I could use light protocol and like it'll get submitted to this escrow and then we could do whatever we want to do, you know, shielded. But at some point, the money is just going to be for him. Like maybe the balance now shows up in his shielded address, right? But there's no ecosystem where you could actually like pay someone else unless like the world is now all in this protocol. Like at some point, it seems like he might need to withdraw. Mm -hmm. So I guess like maybe let's connect those dots. Like how does this eventually, is the world eventually just going to all need to move over to these shielded protocols? Or is there like any way for this to actually help people do things like on the public chain too with while preserving their privacy? Essentially what this creates is a second liquidity pool, right? So in, in that sense, this is like sort of liquidity silo where when you want to go back to, you know, public Solana addresses, you have that, you know, unshielding moment where the recipient that is in public is known again. It will always be that case that when you use public addresses for public transfers, that's always going to be known. Sure. What happens is once you use that, like protocol once, is you break that on-chain link between where the money comes from and where it ends up. And the cool thing really is that it's it's not really necessarily about, you know, just funneling funds from one public address to another without, you know, with breaking the on-chain link. It's really about sort of the things that you can do in this pool. So essentially what you now can do is you could have a private NFT marketplace. So basically you shield your NFTs and now uh, you have these ownership nodes and it can have a specific type of ownership node that can def- define could be NFT listings, counter offers, uh, multi-sig transactions, all these sort of things. Uh, so you have this like second ecosystem, to, so to speak, that you can build out with different programs that are all interoperable with each other. And none of this is, is public necessarily. Obviously, you know, you can, if you're a developer, you can encode like auditability and these sort of things. But uh, by default, you have the choice to to show what's what's public and what's private. So, you know, the, the core principle is that essentially this creates this sort of like second ecosystem where things are private. Just because chains like Solana or Ethereum, they're not natively privacy compatible. You you sort of need this new abstraction, which, you know, goes from account model to UTXO model. Just coming back to that NFT example, because, yeah, it's really interesting. So the idea would be that you'd have this sort of private off-chain NFT marketplace, because presumably you could have private auctions and like much as you get in the real world, you know, often deals are made uh, not in the public sphere. And yeah, you you can definitely see that there would be a a marketplace for that, um, for these very high value transactions. People maybe don't want to know like, how much they're selling for and um, and who's necessarily, I suppose you'll know who's bought them because you'll be able to track that on chain. But it's very interesting. With regards to this NFT example, like if I'm trying to sell really valuable NFTs or just create a marketplace for them, like are, are there any risks though with this approach where we're not using the base layer, where we're kind of using these escrow contracts and I have, you know, a board ape or something worth 200K. Like, I guess like how do you convince people that they're, that this is, the right thing to do you know this is like all of these protocols are, are still like kind of being researched and developed uh, like what does that transition look like to eventually get tons of economic value on these ecosystems we'll see right like <laughs> we'll we'll find good use cases for people to to actually be like oh i want privacy for this and, and especially in the realm of maybe nft trading maybe it's treasury management and multi six maybe it's uh on-chain games with fog of war I, we don't know Right. So what we're building is this infrastructure. And now we're super curious to see what people come up with. Hopefully new things that we can't even fathom right now. I think that that would be the most amazing thing for us to see. Strategically, it's it's just that we want to look for the most high value use cases. Right. So, I mean, the way we're building this infrastructure, but we're really also trying to figure out like, you know, what are these where are the power users? So, so far, we've spoken to a bunch of NFT whales that seem very excited about just the idea of this very specific use case of NFT trading. So we'll try to sort of bootstrap it from there. There's also, for specific use cases, this interoperability with the public sphere. It's just that 
because it's natively on Solana, you know, every Solana address can generate a shielded address and you can have that that movement of funds to sort of the shielded escrow to the shielded sphere within one transaction. It's a little bit closer to to Solana than rollups or layer twos on, on other blockchains, which I think is helps the case, right? For people to sort of be like, oh, this is another contract to your question. That's, I think this the second biggest thing is like trust. Obviously, you know, we all say that in blockchain, like it should be trustless, but in the end you have humans trusting developers to not introduce bugs to their software. So basically, uh, there's a couple things you can do. The, the way that we think of our system is that we have this Merkle tree that is like the single entry and exit point for, for funds. Um, Merkle tree where you have UTXO commitments inserted and then also uh, you know the funds are stored in there, actually. like You can see that on chain. One of the, the next steps, hopefully near to midterm is to make that immutable. So the way we, we see it is like, really when you use Solana, right, you have smart contract disk as well. There's like native built-in programs like the system program. And, you know, these are like high security programs. You don't want to mess up when you do changes, when you make changes in these core programs. But um, yeah, that's how we think about our, our own system programs, so to speak. One of them being the Merkle tree program. And then we have like a set of built-in programs that just verify basically that when a new developer builds their own permissionless program, they also do a cross-program invocation into our system verifier programs. And these just verify as well that actually the inputs of whatever the developer built are okay and that the UTXO in and outputs are okay. And uh, it then just ch- makes changes in the Merkle tree where it actually moves funds around technically so, you know, it's the same sort of architecture or the same sort of security assumptions that you that you would have with something like Solana as well. I'd love to touch upon a few more examples of things that you've imagined could be built. So obviously, you've got this idea of these private NFT trading areas. I think you've also mentioned gaming. So the idea there, I'm assuming, being that if you've got a fully on-chain game, part of the issue there is that the logic of the game is is on-chain and and therefore, the fog of war, as you keep saying, um, it's hard to create uh, suspense and, and intrigue in a game if, if it's all laid out bare in front of you. So is the idea that you would uh, keep the logic potentially um, or the engine, if you like, of the game off chain in this private realm? The most basic example would be, let's say you have these trading card games where you have a set of decks and each character is an NFT, right? So now you have two players who want to you know select a deck maybe they you know have some certain attributes or weapons or whatever that they want to attach to their character to change the stats of that character and then they want to play this next round and the other player should not really know uh, what set of nfts or sfts i have committed to right so basically what would happen is that we'd have our nfts in the in the shield pool and we'd have these ownership nodes so then basically we can have this logic off chain where we commit to our set of nfts and then it's most likely going to be a mix of public on chain data and and private private data you have that with nft trading as well for instance right so when you do a listing when you create a listing you don't encrypt your utxo so basically what you do is you emit uh, this UT, UTXO on chain that says, oh, I'm, I'm listing an NFT, X, Y, Z. And optionally, I could also say to, for what price I'm willing to sell. Um, and you don't encrypt that. So basically now the set of users can see that there's a listing. And in this case, they would you know, either execute that UTXO without anyone knowing. So you have fully private trade execution. Or the other users can create counter offers and encrypt these to the person that listed the UTXO, right? So you have that mix of private and public based on whatever logic you want to introduce. I'm just trying to think how other games are going to deal with those sorts of issues um, if they haven't got this sort of inbuilt privacy. So it does seem like a massive unlock. I'm just also wondering on the trading side of things, how you see that going, because I'm wondering about like MEV, being able to hide your transactions from sandwich bots. Not that 
that's really an issue on Solana, to be fair. And also there's like dark pools in TradFi of like OTC over the counter trading between whales um, where they like it, like all the information to be hidden, basically. So just wonder if you had a think around use cases around trading. I mean, it was essentially this idea would be to take the idea of a dark pool, um, OTC trading, and put that on chain verifiably. I don't know of any like huge dark pool protocol um, in 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 either you know chain or ecosystem. The truth is, we'll have to see uh, you know how adoption what adoption looks like there. All we have is we have hunches. We have you know initial feedback from NFT whales on Solana. I mean that's the truth, right? Like we'll have to see how how it works. I think the idea of just like building cool new stuff um, that is now possible, um, and 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 you know for us it's really like building the infrastructure that enables these cool things. Um, I think just that that's just very exciting. And then and then hopefully there's other developers who are willing to take these primitives, work with them, and then you know work with end users and build things that achieve traction. Anatoly's kind of tweeted about this topic at a broader level a few times. And I want to just bring up a couple of his his tweets here where he says, at one point, snark optimized programs are fully composable, no need for rollups, one state machine to rule them all. And I think he's also at one point said like L2s could be ideal for things like privacy on Solana. But I guess my question is, how did you guys architecturally decide to implement it such that you're basically deploying on the L1 instead? Like were there some usability um, gains from that? It seems like there are, obviously. It's not an L2. Like it's a developer will use either like something like ZKJS or the core protocol and like give their users the ability to essentially shield their transactions. But it seems like Anatoly was almost suggesting he might see a world where an L2, kind of like what you're seeing on Ethereum, where like an L2 will be like this privacy chain almost. What we're trying to understand is like, is there something unique about Solana that made this possible? And like, you don't even need the L2 at that point. Like, how did this architecturally, how did you guys arrive at this design? When people think about the brand L2, because essentially it's like, it's a brand, right? Yeah. Like. You could argue that uh, <laughs> L2s are essentially layer ones. They are, yeah. <laughs> L2s are usually thought of as scalability tools for Ethereum layer one. So, and, and that's the whole branding that goes with it. That's just because, you know, Ethereum transactions um, are much slower and much, much more costly than anything that you would want if you want to build user facing applications. I think that's the more that's the most distinct factor here is that with Solana, it's actually feasible to verify small zk snark proofs and these are the sort of the smallest proofs you can get really uh, in terms of byte size and just compute them in a single transaction you know 400 milliseconds verification time it's essentially when you send it for rpc nodes it's like one to two seconds right now uh with solana that's usually what uh, what rpcs can do i mean the block time is is about you know 500 milliseconds and you can do that, and it's it's actually feasible, right? So, uh, I think that's that's the most distinctive factor in terms of like liquidity silos that you have of layer twos. It's actually quite similar to that uh, with Light Protocol, right? Just because you need this change in how the whole model works, right? It goes from account model to UTXOs. I think that makes sense. Maybe that's what I was trying to drive at: is why is it that it's so quick to verify a proof on Solana? Why does it take so long to like shield money and some Ethereum based protocol? Funnily enough, so far, Ethereum has been much more friendly to ZK snark proof verification, specifically sort of the Growth 16 proofs that, that we're utilizing as well. So, as far as I know, it's, it's also just like within one block, with one, one, one transaction that you send it off, you can compute a, a ZK snark. The core thing is really that Ethereum is just much slower than Solana. Sure. Yeah. Longer block times. Yeah. Longer block times. And then you have, you know, fee markets that are global because, you know, every transaction basically competes for global block space. Solana could technically also get to a point where, you know, there's global competition for block space, but that's very unlikely. I mean, when I, when I asked Anatoly, it was like literally like, yeah, we'll just double <laughs> validator requirements <laughs> and then <laughs> here we go. It's just like, we'll just we'll just increase block space. And that's actually quite feasible because of the way that Solana works, right? So sort of scales with 
with hotware. And like, I think it's important to bring up just because usability wise separately, I mean, this is all obvious stuff, but it's just so cheap because it requires a lot of uh, signatures to actually do the shielding. And Solana is so cheap, like conceivably you could like have a dollar and like, you know, do all of like the signs, the signings and, and have it shielded. Whereas on ETH, you might spend like, you know, tens, if not more dollars just to play around with it. Which I think is important for people to like get comfortable with this stuff. But the only way you actually learn it is by using it, not by like you know getting on the whiteboard and trying to understand it all. Um, and I think Solana has a bit of a leg up where people can just play with it a lot, much much easier, much faster, and much cheaper. When I first got started, and I was looking at Solana um, because you know my co-founder introduced me to it. I just pro- like ran a transaction on just on command line with the CLI, <laughs> and I was like, wow, like this was my local test validator yeah so you know it's not even it's not even that special but it was just like so quick i was like wow i can actually send money and and you know technically it's verifiable as soon as it runs on a public network i mean i was used to so in 2017 right like ethereum ecosystem already discussed like scaling and proof of stake that's how how i got in actually my co-founder introduced me to blockchain and, and cryptocurrencies in 2017 and I, I sent an Ethereum transaction and it like took like, you know, 10, 16 minutes to, um, to settle. And I was like, okay, that's the state of things, right? Like, I don't see anything usable coming out of this. Subsequently, I also got very disillusioned when bull market of 2017 was over. But going from that to processing a Solana transaction and like, was like this mind blowing moment. Now we can actually do stuff. Now, what's changed is that now Solana has. In the runtime, it's merged. It's not activated on mainnet yet. But what it has now is it has a syscall for that specific ZK snark computation. Our version one was like we had to actually split up the verification and process it like just like shoot like shoot 216 transactions on chain in parallel and just hope to verify them. Because ZK snarks like ZK proof verification is heavy computation wise. And so we had to like do this like split up and work around. Which you know it took like forty seconds, uh, it, and in total it cost like I think like five cents, ten cents if you account for sort of also the nullifiers and the commitment accounts that we would uh, emit. So it's you know it's fine, and that's what you see when you like go to shield.lightprotocol.com, like when you use the interface, like that's the sort of user experience you get. Our team has built the uh, sort of a syscall for it, just like Ethereum has, and now zk snark verification is about two hundred thousand compute units which fits in one uh, Solana transaction. Right now is this like whole new design space that opens up. So yeah, so basically it's going to cost the same as a couple of uh, Solana transactions. Is that right? For a basic transfer, it's actually just like the cost of one transaction. The way that, you know, there are a couple of other elements you need to solve, not just the verification itself. For instance, um, when basically what we have with these UTCO models, right, is that we need to emit uh, nullifiers for every UTXO that we spend, right? And and we need to create new UTXOs. So we need to emit um, commitments for the new UTXOs. So basically, what that is um, on a high level is that you know a commitment is just like a like a random string. It's like a like hash of data, uh, a couple of bytes, and uh, we need to insert that into the Merkle tree that is on chain. The way that we do it is that you know classically you would just create a PDA and you would store that data on chain. Uh, creating a PDA with each transaction is quite expensive. So there's this thing called uh, compressed accounts, right? And you obviously have heard about them. It was used for NFTs, like compressed NFTs, right? Uh, you can do the same thing for any sort of account. So we've implemented um, compressed accounts in a way where now these commitments, these leaves of the Merkle tree would be stored on the ledger. So they would be, still be processed on chain. And, and I don't know if you're sort of aware of how compressed accounts works, but essentially on a high level is um, you process a transaction, you send the data that you want to store through a Solana transaction. So you're still bound to about one kilobyte of transaction byte size, but it doesn't get stored in an on-chain account. It just gets stored on the ledger of the validator. And then you can still read from it. Uh, you just need to create the right indexer to, to read from that. It's, Super simple, but amazing just idea to actually save um, a lot of money when you create NFTs, but also accounts. So that's like the other thing you need to figure out to make it the cost of a Solana transaction. 
But yeah, normal Solana trans like normal private Solana transactions are just like normal Solana transactions. So in terms of cost and, and speed. And then by extension, if you have more complex private Solana programs, right? We, that's what we call them, is like let's say you have like a an NFT marketplace. The way that our CLI currently creates the template for the those private Solana programs is it, it has three computation, three steps that get executed for for the whole process. And that's not because of the computation, that's because of the transaction size limit. Because you know, if if you have more public inputs, which you need if you have more complex circuits, you know, more complex uh, zero knowledge proofs, you need uh more bytes, and that's why you're sort of splitting it up into multiple transactions. That's the scope of performance there. Is that uh, going to be merged soon? Did you, did you say to mainnet? It has been merged since November. Uh, we had this little bummer uh, with the last uh, Solana outage, obviously, that sort of like stalled the whole feature activation of, you know, I think now there's a list of like, you know, 20 to 30 features that are not activated yet. It's just not, it's not turned down and it's not part of um, the current mainnet release or even testnet release. So actually what we had to do to launch it on testnet, it's our custom testnet. So we have this, uh, you know, local test validator running on Kubernetes and uh, uh, exposing a public endpoint. And so you know, that's the workaround. We're trying hard to, I mean, I would love to, to see it activated by, you know, end of the summer or before. It'd be, it'd be interesting to get your get your views on the uh, on the regulatory side of things because architecturally it sounds similar to tornado cash on ethereum which obviously is now um has ofac restrictions against it and i think they they arrested the um the founder and then there's all this talk about north korean money um flowing through there so just wondering how you view that aspect of privacy protocols as unfortunate a reality as it, as it is our stance on, with Light Protocol is that we're always going to be compliant in a sense that we want to have this like neutral base layer that we're creating and give the, you know, the developers on top of that all the tools that they need to create whatever is compliant in their country or jurisdiction where, where they want to launch their product. So, you know, that's the, that's the core principle is like really enable compliance, whatever that will look like uh, in the future. I'm I'm pretty confident that Mainstream adoption for blockchains is is only gonna you know be achieved if if we have decent regulation and compliant protocols. I mean, there's a couple of measures uh, that we do with sort of our v1. So basically, the relay scans addresses that want to shield into Light Protocol. Um, you know, if they're part of OFAC or any other high risk um, lists blocked. Yeah, and and then there's a you know sort of deposit limit on what you can do per per shielding, which should make it quite hard for you know people to move funds that are listed at large large amounts. It's like with Solana as well. Um, it's like you have bad shit happening on Solana, like with any other blockchain. And arguably, you know, the same thing happens with normal payment processes as well. Is uh, there's banks are subject to money laundering and these sort of things. The important thing I think is really also narrative wise. There's all these good things that happen on Solana and all these good things and, and useful things that happen with other payment rails. And, and that's what I think is like with Light and also when you compare it to like tools like Zcash or, or Tornado is um, the, the beautiful thing really is that you can have like on-chain games, right? And you can have all these like colorful applications that have nothing to do with the risks of some percentage of amount of funds being you know illicit turning the idea of privacy which you know is part of the i think even american constitution i'm not american but (laughs) privacy is just like this basic human right takes this idea and just rolls of it and sort of creates this new design space for new applications and you know the idea is to to get away from any connotations of illicit use no that makes sense i think kind of to summarize and close out here because i think that's a really good point is kind of zooming out a bit right like i heard of zcash back in 2016 2017 i actually my first on-chain crypto transaction was with monero uh, because i really did believe in that like the mission of everything's got to be private you know why why are all of our things and databases that can be just looked at by anybody fundamentally i agree with that so much and but here we are five years later six years later and like both of those protocols aren't really used that much and the kind of the design space has moved past it almost 
And so with all that in mind, like paint us a picture of how you see the ZK landscape playing out in the next, I don't know, five years. Um, is it going to be like a mix of people doing things on public blockchains and also doing some stuff on ZK? Like, how, how do you see this playing out? In terms of privacy, I mean, there's a couple of assumptions here. And the first assumption is that in five years, Solana will be one of the, if not the leading ecosystem for, you know, application developers that, you know, want to use blockchain. There's definitely like this super high conviction bet on Solana for us as well, because like we're building stuff that's custom on Solana. We want to be as close to Solana as possible just be, because, you know, it makes sense. And then obviously like there's great use cases where you don't need privacy at all, right? Like there's other use cases where, you know, privacy would be interesting, but it's also super hard to implement. Like it, as soon as you have something like lending, you need to have quite a bit of um, public data. So there's definitely going to be this mix. But I think that there's just this realm of use cases, uh, especially I think in the, in the on-chain gaming and especially in payments and a couple of others as well. Like if you have, you know, treasury management businesses who actually want to move on-chain, they obviously demand privacy. And, you know, there's like this just range of, of use cases that uh, I can see like where privacy is extremely useful and also being utilized in, you know, a couple of years from now. And also, like, in terms of five years, I mean, we're thinking in terms of, like, you know, you can start building, like, private Solana programs now. Um, usually, it takes quite some time until developers get really creative and, like, take this primitive and, like, build new use cases and new applications. But, yeah, I think that's also going to be part of it in the next couple of years. Like, things that I couldn't name you right now uh, being built based, based on that primitive. Awesome. Awesome. No, definitely a lot to look forward to there. And uh, I'm excited also to see what developers come up with, with this idea of private Solana programs and privacy as a primitive, which seemingly is, is pretty easy to use. And so super exciting stuff. Swen, thanks so much for sharing your time with us. And uh, it was a blast. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Al. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Al.